Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Um, they, uh, there have been over 330 of them now, and you can find them all archived and categorized in various ways at batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. Uh, we appreciate the financial support of those who feel inspired to offer it. There's a donate button on the site that enables us to do this show. So my guest today is Della. She has a last name, but she's just going to go by Della. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, Della had the good fortune of a life that many would have wanted to live. She grew up in a loving environment. She went to college. She started a family. She became a doctor and worked in an emergency room. She wasn't looking for anything. She didn't have any spiritual beliefs. She was happy. Then. In 2005, during a hypnosis session, she had what could be described as a near-death experience. Her heart was deeply touched by oneness and its unconditional love. Her life was turned upside down by this experience. With this free and loving presence breathing inside of her, all of her identity was put into question. Gradually, she had to surrender to the reality that we are one and that no label, belief, or knowledge is needed for being, capital B. Her website is DellaInvitation.com. <clears throat> so that was uh, some hypnosis session you had there. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> but you had, had you been doing hypnosis already for a bit, or was that like your first time you ever tried it? No, it was my, my first time, in, in fact. Uh, I went uh, the week before to see a psychologist because there was kind of a uh, situation in the family, and I was wondering if I could help. So, and the psychologist said, well, maybe we could do just a hypnosis session and see what comes out of there. And I said, fine. And um, so when we started the session, he said, well, um, do you have a question before entering uh, the session? And I said, yes, uh, how can I radiate peace in my house? So that was a question. And so I went through this beautiful uh, experience and uh, well it transformed my life yeah um, pl please try to describe the experience itself in a little bit more detail it's not, it seems like even now it, it moves you to think about it so um, try to give us a, a glimpse of, of what you actually experienced well uh, I went into um, uh, um, Let's say there were many stairs and I had to go to the 10th level. I don't know. This was um, uh, the suggestion of the psychologist. And then uh, I opened the big doors and there were this tunnel, uh, this tunnel of light. And I went through the tunnel of light and I, I went out of this body and I became, um, I don't know, a, a being of light. And there were others there with me surrounding me with this love and after that it just melted in just uh, oneness and consciousness and um, there was just this beautiful unconditional love where everything is perfect and so uh, that was really a really intense experience at that moment and when I came back up there in my body, uh, I was just uh, weeping, you know, it was just so intense. But the experience subsided afterwards. It took about 24 hours to come back home <laughs> here. And, uh, but, but then this uh, unconditional love uh, never left. It, it, it's just uh, uh, part of who, who we are, who, who we all are. And so with this, uh, ex after this experience, I was um, accompanied with a, a voice. So there was a voice within me for about two, two years after that. And the invitation of that voice was always to, uh, uh, would I be ready to love and, and give away my identity, my gifts, because there were many gifts given after that, like uh, seeing auras and becoming the other and um, seeing past lives and all those um, uh, experiences that are different than what we used to experience. But there were only experiences 
so uh, the invitation was to, was to let them go. Mm -hmm. So let me it ask took you a about, couple things here. So yeah. first of yeah. all, when you went into that state, which you you say is akin to a near death experience, um, did and you and some beings met you or something? Were were those like deceased loved ones, or did did you not know who they were? No, there there was no uh, personal identity associated to them. It was just uh, beings, hmm. like just some was... beings of light. Could you describe them, or were they just kind of amorphous, like clouds of light or something? It was more light beings. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was no special form. It was just more a sense of connection with those beings than than connection to form. Yeah. Had you ever had anything? when you were a little child um, that was out of the ordinary? Or was this like the first thing that ever happened to you that was, you know, kind of like a far out experience? Well, when I was a child, I could see auras uh, quite easily. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, you know, the adults uh, said that that was not possible. So I stopped <laughs> seeing them about, I, I was eight years old and I stopped seeing them. So, so then that was the first time after that, that uh, I could open up again. Yeah. yeah. Um, from the age of eight or whatever until this happened, by which time you were a doctor and everything, had had your life remained pretty sane and stable and smooth, or had you gone through you know crazy teenage years and all that kind of thing? No, I, I was. Um, it, it was a simple life. Simple, I would say, even loving life, mm -hmm. easy life. Uh, you know, I was good at school, uh, I had a loving husband and family, I loved my job, uh, so there was not much to worry about, you know. Yeah. Um, so this voice that you started having uh, after this experience, um, how would you characterize that? Was it just sort of an intuitive impulse? Was it speaking to you in, in French? Or, you know, what, what, was it, what was the quality or nature of that voice? Uh, it wasn't French. Uh, it was. It felt. Um, it felt like something higher talk to, talking to me. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there was not much separation between what I would hear and what I would receive. Mm. Um, so that was. Uh, I think it was only a guidance there, just to, uh, inviting me to let go of uh, identity. And it was very, very patient. So if I was not ready to let go of something, it was just uh, kind of, uh, I would feel kind of a smile and it, it would wait mm -hmm. and it would come back. You know, it was just so patient, so yeah. patient with me. So it was beautiful. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have a feeling that um, it was like a, a spirit guide or something that was in any way different from you or was it actually just your own higher self or some higher intuitive uh, aspect of who, who and what you are? I guess at the beginning it felt uh, kind of um, different than I, but after time, you know, it was, it was just all the same. Everything is just all the same. So it was, uh, uh, I was not able to differentiate between what was different and what was reality. You know, there, this had faded away right. uh, along the time. And so meanwhile, I mean, you said it took about 24 hours to come down from the initial experience. Uh, and then obviously you had children, you had your job and all that stuff. So you had probably had to carry on with those responsibilities. Um, how did your orientation to the world change? I mean, were you like walking around as if a whole new person in a way, um, you know, a whole new perception of your children, whole new, whole new interaction in your job, or was it more vague and subtle than that? It was very intimate to start with, so there was not a lot of changes uh, to be observed from the outside when it started at, in 2005, the intensity of it became more clearer uh, at the end of 2006 and 2007. There I went through uh, um, uh, this identification quite deep, mm. so uh, I could not recognize my kids. Uh, 
Um, I would grow to, to go to the grocery store with my kids because they would put things in the basket, you know, because I had no idea what this is, was all about. Mm -hmm. But I could, un I could totally observe that I could drive, I could go somewhere. It, life it was living, but there was no one on board, you know, to... Well, there was someone on board because I, I could... I, I could do things, but uh, the identification to logic and and thinking was not was not there. So at that moment, I I was able to work only one week uh, on two. Well, yeah, like uh, every other week. Uh -huh. be and be this only able to because you just were not capable of doing more. Is that why you're only able to? Uh, no, uh, it was a choice, but it was very difficult at the time to uh, to work because uh, I was working in a big emergency in Montreal uh, in 2005, and then we left for New Zealand to work in the small uh, country hospital, which was really nice because it was not busy. So I didn't need to use my mind too much mm -hmm. to work. You know, there was those uh, reflexes that were fine. But at the same time, it was very difficult for me to work because uh, patients coming in were just perfect. So that, for me, there was nothing to fix. Mm. So it was really difficult to, to play that game of being uh, sick. Anyway. So if somebody came in with a broken leg or a ruptured appendix, you would think, eh, they're just perfect the way they are? Well, in a sense, it, it, in my heart, it felt like it was perfect and life was taking care of everything else. So it doesn't mean that you don't attend a broken leg. It just means that things are just done uh, prior to the idea that we have to fix something and someone is fixing something. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just obvious that life is taking care of, ever, of everything in different forms so being s someone who's taking care of something was just very foreign to me but then yeah but then you are part of life so even if you don't didn't regard yourself as someone taking care of some of stuff you were part of life taking care of stuff couldn't you say that but you know that's true uh so i can continue to work for a while and uh but after a while, in October 2007, I went to work one morning and there was nothing left in my brain uh, associated to medical knowledge. So that was uh, something really important that shifted uh, in my life. And the voice just told me, are you ready to let go of that too? Mm. So I could not prescribe a Tylenol. I, I had no idea what the patients would have, which is <laughs> kind of scary. But at the same time, it was just so obvious that I just had to let go of that kind of knowledge. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions. One is, um, from the time of your initial awakening, did it inspire you I mean, did you engage in a mad scramble to figure out what had happened to you and start reading all kinds of books and things like that? Or did you somehow just know what had happened to you? I had no idea what was happening to me. Um, I didn't know any spiritual... I haven't read anything. So I, I thought... Sometimes I thought I was in psychosis. Mm -hmm. uh, because of all those extreme experiences and, and uh, so my surroundings also thought I was in psychosis, um, which meaning, was... Meaning people around you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They thought yeah. you'd gone crazy. Well, I, you know, I'm from a medical background too, so of course those kind of experiences don't fit in a book. Um, so I was kind of um, uncomfortable with what I was going through. Sometimes sometimes it would be very painful because there was this ego who, who wanted to know what was happening and wanted to stay on board. And so there was kind of a fight. Uh, but um, my brother, uh, my brother Don was uh, really close to me during that time. And he had some knowledge in spirituality. 
So he, he just was my uh, beacon light, you know, mm. towards the journey, uh, telling me that uh, that it was okay. But then, uh, you know, it's just after all the thing went through that I, I received a um, video of Adya Shanti. And when I watched the video, I said, okay, I'm not crazy, you know, kind of a, kind of a real funny feeling, you know, that this was not, uh, this, this was really something possible. And uh, so it was reassuring to, to have that video. And I went after that a couple of days in retreat in Australia with Adya Shanti. Mm. And it was just so soothing, you know, just to, just to, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, just to bath in, in, in this evidence. Oh, sure. So. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, because there are stories of people. Um, one of the kind of more dramatic ones is this woman named Suzanne Siegel, who wrote this book called Collision with the Infinite. And she underwent a really radical, abrupt awakening like that. And even though she had a spiritual background, she was even a meditation teacher, it, what she experienced was so different than what she had anticipated or understood that she had no idea what it was. And, and she lived in a state of abject terror for about 10 years until she finally relaxed and accepted that it was something good. Jean Klein helped her make that shift. Um, so uh, I guess it's just worth mentioning that because there are probably other people out there ha having experiences like this who mm. don't haven't necessarily yet found any kind of reassurance or guidance as to what's happening to them, and they could even end up in hospitals and you know, mental hospitals and so on. Yeah, absolutely. I just uh, read an article last week on Facebook about uh, an article in the. Um, in psychology, and it was difference between psychosis and awakening, mm. which was really, really interesting for me. You know, so many years after to see that there was something written on that uh, and on internet available. So anyway, it was really interesting for me to have. Yeah, I'd like to see that article. You should maybe forward it to me, and I'll I'll check it out. Um, sure. In fact, maybe people listening would like to see it too. I could even, I don't know could post it on your on your page on Batgap or something if people are interested. Um, or you could put it on your Facebook page. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, uh, people I, can go there. Yeah. Um, so was there a lot of struggle with, within you in terms of, uh, you know, having to let go of your uh, profession and uh, and things like that, where you kind of like battling it and, and trying to hang on and, and, you know, trying to keep it together on that level? Um, yeah, there's, of course, there was a, a part of me who was uh, trying to do something with that. But at the same time, there was a knowing, a deep knowing that I had no choice. Yeah. So uh, I guess... Uh, one of the things that was very difficult for me is to let go of medicine because I loved my job. And it took about eight months. Uh, when, it, when the knowledge left me, it took about eight months for me to, uh, to go through um, the process of, of uh, the name is... Uh, uh, Integration. You know, when some, yeah, when someone dies, you know, you go through... Um, Weaning? No. Grieving? Grieving. Right. Yeah. So it's, sorry, it took about eight months for me to go through that process of letting go of that. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was, it just become really simple. Really, really Did simple. other things in your life fall apart? I mean, your marriage, did you, did that happen? Yeah, did this that... fell apart too. Because um, you, you just didn't get what was going on? <laughs> Yeah, well, there was many things, but, you know, I was very free also. Uh, there was this conditioning that was gone. And, uh, and uh, of course, there was a part that um, I was seen as kind of a crazy lady mm. and all that. So there was many factors that, that came to that ending. But uh, it was just part of what I had to go through, which is... Uh, which is beautiful, you know, now. Yeah. How many kids do you have? Three. 
and what do they think about you now? Well, uh, I'm. Uh, they are very. Uh, both girls are, are really, really close to me, and uh, we have beautiful contact. My son is uh, is uh, interested in in what I'm teaching. Uh, you know, there's a curiosity, but there's also a distance. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a lot of love. Yeah. There's a lot of love, so that's beautiful. I think. Uh, we all are being transformed with uh, with we what we live. So it's it's beautiful. What would you say to people who hear your story and who think, you know, I don't know if I actually want to go for this awakening <laughs> business because I don't want my life to fall apart. You know, I like my job. I like my family. I'm afraid that if I have an awakening, it's all going to fall apart. What would you say to them? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, well, if it's going to happen, you, there's no choice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and, you know, if the calling within is so strong, those questions will arise. And we have, we have sometimes, you know, we have the freedom to say yes, and we have the freedom to say no. But if the yearning is there, it's going to come back. Mm. You know, nothing has to fall apart. I don't think everything has to fall apart, but sometimes it does have to yeah. fall apart. So. so in other words, some people in your understanding might undergo a profound radical inner awakening and their outer life might not appear to change at all. And, yeah. and, and other people might be more like you where everything changes. Yes, I think so too. Yeah. Um, and would you say that's because some people have a, a calling that is not congruent with their current lifestyle, um, such as yours, uh, such as you did, and whereas other people don't have that calling and they'll be perfectly happy continuing to be an, elect an enlightened electrician or something. I I don't know. I could I could not say. Really, I could not say. I was really I felt really aligned with my life before, mm -hmm. so. Uh, and I feel real aligned with my life now, so I don't know. Uh, I think there was a part of me that could not exist in my prior life um, with this uh, change in my life. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's difficult uh, to put in a box, you know. It's 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 different from one person to another. Yeah, and that was kind of a boxy question that I asked, but um. I guess I just asked it to reassure people that, you know, set your, to, to just sort of set your, if you have a choice, if you feel an inspiration or an aspiration for spiritual development and spiritual awakening, go for it and don't worry about the consequences. It'll all be for the best and it doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to change radically in your outer life, but they may, but if they do, it'll be for the best. Yeah. I think so too. <laughs> I think I think it's fine. Uh, of course, the spiritual path is scary for identification. I think that's true. That's th that's the reality of things because identification does not exist. So, uh, of course, there is something really scary. But identification can also exist, and the soul, of course, exists through the process. So, so we, it can be gentle. It doesn't have to be hard, but we we can question with authenticity and love what is what is what we share most, what is the most precious thing in our lives that we want to go through. You know, if we want to see through identification, of course identification won't like it. Why don't you define identification for the sake of the viewers? Well, identification is, is all the, the idea we have on, on oneself about uh, who we are in life, uh, our name, our family, our work, all the, um, all the characters we play to be, to be loved uh, from outside, uh, to be in security, all those characters we play that, is, that are kind of uh, limiting all the time but it's because it, it creates security which is which is good 
So, of course, when we realize that we are free of that, or when we wish to realize that we are free of that, well, it's going to be a challenge to look at all those identifications and see if they're still necessary or not mm. in our lives. It sounds like in your case, identification even included things like, you know, broccoli and, and spinach and cereal because you had to take your kids to the grocery store because you didn't know what to, what to put in the cart. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. But even, you know, even at that point, I could just realize that everything was going great. You know, everything was was going the way it was supposed to go, even if I was not there. You know, there was nothing there to to take control of that. Yeah. Which was amazing. So you were kind of on autopilot. So to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So would one way of describing what happened to you be to say that there was a radical falling away of the sense of a personal self or a personal me. Yeah, it was a radical uh, transformation, but that lasted on time. It took about a couple of years to to let go of everything. Mm. Uh, and it it ended uh, after realizing that I, I had a lot of beautiful experiences of light and uh, at one point, I, I made meditation, and I asked that all those gifts uh, were were taken away from me. Mm -hmm. It was there was nothing necessary uh, to add to the simple reality of, of what is. Mm -hmm. So uh, about 36 hours later, it just left me. It, it, there was a, this flow of energy going out of me for about two hours. And when I came back from that experience, I could recognize what was a kitchen for and what was a fork for, and I could recognize my kids. And so it was just an amazing, amazing experience to see how beautiful ordinary reality is. So just to clarify, so when you said you're ha having all kinds of beautiful experiences of light, I presume you mean like auras and angels and all sorts of nice flashy experiences right yeah um, yes and so you, you realize that those things were not not necessary right yes um, yes and then when you say you ask them to be taken away and then they they left and then you could recognize what a kitchen is and what a fork is did you mean to say that before they were taken away you had a hard time recognizing what a kitchen is and what a fork is? i had no idea what it was for really so does that mean you were so kind of caught up in or uh, engaged in these beautiful experiences of light that you had a really hard time uh, in recognizing and interacting with ordinary reality. Is that what you mean to say? Yeah, it was kind of a, the attention went to the extraordinary, the extraordinary things. I see. So. Yeah. So you'd be in your kitchen, for instance, and there'd be angels or something. You'd be all caught up in that and to the point where you weren't able to interact properly with the ordinary kitchen that was there. <laughs> yeah, well, there was no angels, but or whatever was, these yeah, experiences the, the, were. Yeah, yeah, the attention was was elsewhere. So uh -huh. yeah, I, I had no idea what it was a kitchen for. Which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's strange. I mean, it must have been very hard to function. If you didn't know what a kitchen for, how were you was for? How were you even eating? I guess it was eating. Um, well, most of the, the the food was prepared by my husband at that time because I was not really, uh, I could not organize my mind to cook something, mm -hmm. which which was okay. You know, there was no not a lot of problem with that. But I, I could totally see that it was functioning functioning fine. Yeah. Just yeah. wasn't functioning so much in this world. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, even my kids did not uh, realize that I was going through all those experiences because the, the mother role seemed to be fine mm. from their point of view, which was uh, curious because I was living in something totally different. Yeah. So mm. when was that, about 2008 or nine or something, when you asked for the the beautiful experiences to go away or, or give 2007 a, 2007 yeah, oh, right. july so yes. nine years ago almost yeah. yeah yeah 
Um, and ever since then, it's just been simple reality. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you imagine or envision a, a time when uh, those experiences returned again? And it was, it's sort of like that stuff is going on, but, but you're so grounded in the, in the simple reality of what is that you have no problem functioning? Or do you think that they'll probably never return and, and you, you wouldn't even want them to? Oh, well, they can be there anytime they need to be there. Mm -hmm. But um, that's, that's all there is to add to that part of reality if 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 it's there it's just there and there's nothing to do with with that mm -hmm. it's just uh, it's just it's just another uh let's say expansion of, of of the same reality which is there too but you don't need to make a story about about that and and make something special about that it's just another yeah. simple reality plan a little icing on the cake as they say yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> huh. um okay so you you pretty much gave up being a doctor and um now you're a spiritual teacher so how did how did you ease into becoming a spiritual teacher i guess you would call yourself a spiritual teacher um how, how did you start transitioning into that? Did people start asking you questions or something and you started talking to them and one thing led to the next or what? Um, I was quite silent for a, a couple of years, uh, no impulse to do anything, uh, except maybe sharing Adya Shanti's video at my place because of, of this uh, aloneness I had during the transition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but finally, I didn't do that either. Uh, I just uh, went uh, to someone who was offering videos to streets from where I was leaving. Adyashanti videos? Yeah. yeah. And so I met those people and I, I spoke about my experience. And then, um, you know, someone heard about my experience and made me uh, meet someone who was giving satsang. And uh, when, he, when we met, he said, well, why don't you give uh, the four days retreat with me uh, this weekend? And I said, well... Who was that? Do you mind I, my asking? It's Mikael Zyper. Oh, I don't know him. Oh. And uh, so um, I was there for the four days retreat and I didn't say a word, I think, for four days <laughs> because there was nothing to say, you know, <laughs> it was I just really sat funny. there. <laughs> I just sat there and uh, finally uh, I, I was asked to give satsangs and uh, to give retreats and that's the way it just started. So when you started giving satsangs and retreats, did you feel like you had very much to say or was it hard for you to like fill up the time with actually talking? When I, I would arrive, always saying that I was that there was nothing to say and then people would ask questions and then it was it would talk yeah it's, so it had something to say obviously because it was talking mm -hmm. uh, so yes there's there's today I think there's so many things things to say and at the same time there's nothing to say but from a human incarnation point of view I think there's a lot to say, there's a lot to discover and uh, mm. to let go, uh, to have the mind help us to let go of things, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. So what are some of the main things you say when you talk to people, when you give retreats or satsangs? What are some of the, your kind of key points or most important points? Well, I think the first key point is that everything arises from love. Uh, the ego, uh, everything we, we think that is not good or that should be transformed, everything is an impulse of love uh, from an intimate point of view. So that is, is for me really important to realize because uh, it helps to stop the fight against, re against reality. Mm. So that's the first thing. And the other thing the, uh, that I emphasize on is um, is the security guards we create, uh, the, the security guards of separation. That is uh, a constant energy that is there to 
create the idea of separation. So that is really interesting to to uh, identify those because we think that we don't want freedom, we, we want to control, but that's not who we are. That's the guardians of separation that do that. It's not who we are. So it's really interesting to see that we are uh, the masters. When I say we, it's like our inner soul is uh, totally uh, free of those guardians. So it's really interesting to see and, and this mechanism. Uh, so we're free of that. So yeah. we free. Now, in your case, you weren't looking for this, and it just sort of came, happened to you. And yeah. uh, you had it just sort of you had no control over it. It just happened. Uh, mm. But when you give a retreat or a satsang, there's a room full of people. Um, yeah. It hasn't just happened to them necessarily, and they are looking for it. They, they're there because they want what you have. Um, yeah. And um, how successful do you feel it is to give descriptions like the one you just gave and actually, you know, convey something uh, to those people or how should I say, be a catalyst so that something of the, so, so that the experiential quality of the words that you just spoke um, can be enlivened in them rather than having it just be an intellectual concept that's taken in, you know, through the words. Okay, well, uh, I guess it, it uh, for me, I'm calling, I'm talking to the heart mm -hmm. uh, from the, the most intimate part, which is uh, free of, of all the concepts. So if the yearning is there, it's not a mental yearning. Mm -hmm. It is something more deeper inside. And, uh, and so when we connect with this part, this intimate part, uh, there is something that can be seen through the veil, you know, that can be recognized and can be seen through the veil. Of course, it's important to uh, to point that awakening is some is most of the time a wish to, of of the ego, okay, because they want to get something else than reality. That's that's and, and that's a loving impulse too. You, you know, we just want to be free, but. Uh, but it's more like, a, an, for me, uh, the real path is opening the heart to reality as it is and see what we put in the way of just being touched by reality mm. because it's a protection and, and we can be uh, more uh, vigilant to see what we put in the way uh, of this beauty that is already here. Yeah. I think a lot of people want awakening because they're suffering. Like the guy I talked, the guy I interviewed last week, he just went through years where he felt like he was really suffering, and you know he just was dying to get out of that suffering, you know. And finally, he had a breakthrough, and he feels more relieved now. But um, what do we put in the way? I mean, and and how much control do we have over putting it in the way? Can can is it a simple voluntary thing to? not put it in the way anymore or does it take time and deconditioning process i guess it depends on on, on people uh, i usually try to see what is uh, what is the true intention of the moment uh, because if you want something else then this reality is going to be interesting to to look at that because uh if you want to change for example in your life uh, the changes can occur here uh, in, in the in taking the risk of of seeing the the refusal that is here in the moment, mm -hmm. and and this refusal is perfect because it's there in the moment. It's protecting something, but can there be enough love in the heart to include this refusal and go and see beyond? You know, in the presence that's there. Can it be? Can it embrace this refusal? It's uh, it's the invitation to recognize the presence that is already here. But uh, I guess if if the ego really wants to have a change, a concrete change in the future, well then it avoids the invitation to come back home in that moment. Of course, it's it's always an open chance every second to to open to presence. Is it, uh, I don't know if this would be possible for you, but would it be possible to remember a specific 
person you worked with and where they were resisting in some way and you helped them to break through that and they, they let go of you know the the blockage that they were putting between themselves and, and reality um, and underwent some shift is it can you think of an example uh, that's a difficult question um, uh, it's a problem with memory which is a yeah. A concern for me. Yeah, I had a feeling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we just arrived from a month uh, uh, retreat in Ecuador, mm. which is a, a beautiful opportunity on the long term because, you know, uh, after a few days, there are some opening and, and vulnerability coming up. Mm -hmm. And after, after, the, after that, there are waves you know, of, uh, of the guardians coming in because they say, whoa, 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 vulner vulnerability is dangerous. So, and there's another wave coming in and then we, and then we open up to it. What is this refusal? What, what, what is, uh, what is at stake here? You know, what is at stake? And then it opens again. And so there's this beautiful, um, way of, of, fighting and letting go and fighting and letting go and um, and the more you're conscious of, about this movement well the f you, you taste that a freedom that is just so sweet yeah, of of looking at all those reaction of refusal of reality and and then it can be totally embraced which is the, the most beautiful gift we can offer ourselves that's nice. Um, so you you pretty much see everybody going through this kind of pattern, fighting, letting go, fighting, letting go. Yeah. Huh. How many people were on the retreat? Uh, thirty three, I think. That's pretty good for a whole month. Yeah, well, thirty three for the first ten days, which was an intensive, and then twenty five stayed for the whole month. Hmm. <clears throat> so at by the end of the retreat, what what how? How do you think people were compared to at the beginning of the treat? Really, a pretty profound transformation for most of them. Well, I guess it would be better to ask them. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm really deeply touched by uh, the transformation of uh, you know the risk going to to the heart and being vulnerable. It's just an amazing transformation for me to, to witness that. Mm. Among people you've worked with, have you seen many of them go through kind of radical changes in their outer lives the way you did? Job, marriage, that kind of thing? It happens. Yeah. Not most of the time, but it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're working with people, like on a retreat or any, and however you work with them, um, do you prescribe something for them to do um, on a daily basis, such as meditation or some kind of self-inquiry or something, or do you mainly just work with them when they're with you? Um, I usually do not give homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not into homework, but at the same time, if there's a, a like a thinking pattern who is kind of destructive or, or uh, creates uh, suffering all the time, I will probably suggest to put a tag uh, on the fridge and you know mm. remember just to to see that that pattern is coming back um, but no I'm not into homework mm. well I've kind of in a little bit earlier when you were talking about just sort of settling into the simple reality and just realizing that everything arises from love uh, kind of reminded me of Byron Katie a little bit you know loving what is and she of course has attempted to um, have a, a systematic process that people can practice independent of her uh, in order to realize you know what what she's talking about so I just that's why that's where my question came from I wonder if you had any kind of little procedures you developed that people could do on a independent basis well of course I have uh, uh, you, you know I have guidelines like suggesting to be authentic, to take responsibility for the inner emotion that is there, uh, just uh, encountering the emotion um, from an open heart. There's there's many things that 
uh, I suggest to develop in, in an, on a daily basis, uh, just to just to open to what's vibrant inside and and to acknowledge what is there. So I I suggest things, but uh, I have the strong belief that everybody has inside what is good for them and if it resonates well it it will happen and if it does not well it can be uh, even violent to to say you know to give homework that is not uh, aligned yeah that's a good point um, so it kind of sounds like you're saying that any sort of external prescription might be hard to match properly with the the needs of you know any large number of people and that people are going to sort of know from an inner impulse what's what they can do and what's right for them yeah i think there's an inner inner wisdom that has to be heard over time you know there's there's answers there and so we suggest, but if it doesn't fit, it, it just doesn't fit. Yeah. You know that voice that spoke to you for a couple of years saying, you know, come on, you want to just step, step in and do this, you know, make this your life's work and all. It has, does that voice still speak or have you actually fulfilled what it was suggesting you do and so it's just sort of sitting back and letting you do it? It doesn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It stopped, I guess, in 2008. Uh -huh. So probably because yeah. you had you, you had sort of signed on for the project, and so it didn't need to bother you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I could not give an explanation to that. It's just not there anymore. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. In your observation, do you feel like um, there's something happening in society in the world uh, on a wider basis? that is similar to what happened to you. In other words, people without even, people are sort of just starting to wake up inside um, through whatever means. I mean, it might not be hypnosis, but whatever they're doing, they're just sort of these, this popcorn effect where people are waking up more and more. There's something in the, in the collective consciousness that seems to be conducive to that. Well, since, um since this happened to me, I can I can observe that there's there's a lot of popping up, uh, which is really beautiful. I don't know if it was happening before because my attention was on not there, right. so I don't know. Um, maybe because internet is there, it's more easier to to witness that. I don't know, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I think society is is kind of toxic more and more toxic uh, for the soul and uh, so we try to survive to this <laughs> strange society in which we live where where we need to have so much possession and, and we need to build up an image and we have to uh, uh, to be the right you know we have to have the right job and we have to be fulfilled by uh, outside so i guess that is a real a strong motor to uh, to come back home, you know, to see the, the craziness of of those movements, and uh, and come back home. Yeah, um, I have these conversations with various friends about this idea of no self, you know, and um, I know you're you're kind of an Adyashanti fan, and Adyashanti gave a whole course about the falling away of, of the sense of personal self. I don't know if you saw that course, but, um, and, and yet there are other quotes from Adyashanti, maybe they were earlier quotes, where he talks about the, fact, the idea that um, it wouldn't even be possible to function as a human being if there's not some sense of a personal self. Um, and yet I have friends who say, no sense of a personal self. And I, I, I just don't understand it. So it's something I actually bring up in interviews fairly often. Um, just to, to help work out my own understanding. I mean, it, it seems to me that if you, um, you know, you stub your toe and it's very painful, there's a sense that, you know, there's some kind of localized experience of it. It's not happening to some guy in China. It's not happening to a tree outside the window. It's happening here to this body-mind. And, and 
you know, you'd rather it were happening to the tree, maybe, because <laughs> it, <laughs> it hurts. But maybe that's not what is meant by falling away of a personal sense of self. What do you, what do you say to that? Um, well, you know, on my journey, uh, there was a point where there was no self, uh -huh. no personal self. Um, the experience of it was no personal self. So I, co I can totally understand the point of view of the, that there is no personal self. But then um, my journey after that was the invitation to let uh, the soul, uh, the free soul, which is the uh, uh, individual part of, of being, to come back in this body. Mm. And, and for me, the part of the soul is quite precious. It's, it's, it's the, the, the most precious thing that we can live here on Earth is just being this uh, this individual color uh, of of the unknown and uh, and radiate what what we need to radiate while we're here. So I think the personal self is, is uh, really precious. So in your experience, when when the sense of personal self had totally fallen away, was that the dysfunctional period in which you know it was hard to shop in the grocery store and all? Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would not say it was dysfunctional because it was functional really well. Sort but, of, yeah. but you were kind of yeah. losing the ability to work as a doctor and you needed your kids to pick out the groceries. And, you know, there was, you were not totally functional as, as you once had been and maybe as you are now. Yeah, uh, as we are uh, conditioned to be, it was different, but it was functioning well, mm -hmm. I think. You know, yeah. there, there's, there's a way we see that things are functioning okay, but it, it seems to function very well. Um, but anyway, that was that phase where there was no personal self, right? Where you, yeah. yeah. And then as the sense of personal self began to come back in, what was that like? Um, did it come in like boom like that or just sort of gradually incrementally? Gradually, it made me realize that uh, um, it was safe for the soul to come back here. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense of fear, I think, uh, uh, fear of the soul of, of coming back here. So I guess the soul was, was gone, you know, it was elsewhere was where life could be safe. The, the scraping of ego and all this period was, was scary for the personal self. Mm. And uh, I guess it, it just went away to take it easy for a while and then <laughs> and then uh, it, it, it the invitation was was to was to come back here so um when you say soul are you equating that with personal self is that what you mean by the word soul yeah i would say so okay um and just to probe this a little bit more if you don't mind um when you were in the no personal self uh phase if you injured yourself in some way, painful, burned your finger or something, did that tend to bring in more of a sense of personal self or was it still like totally impersonal? There was just no, there was pain, but it wasn't pain felt by anyone or something. I remember hurting my toe. I, went, I remember banging my toe and there was a, a, a sense of something happening on my foot but I had no idea to look at it, hmm. uh, no impulse. And the next morning I saw that it was there, there was uh, blood all over, wow. but there was no, um, no pain, no reaction to, to that. There was no sense of protecting it. Uh, so yeah, that was my only, my only experience of physical problem with that. That's interesting because I often use pain as an example of how there seems to me there must be some kind of personal self, you know, because if you if you hurt yourself, it hap it happens to you. But you just you just kind of shot that argument down. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, but that was the only thing. So I didn't have a, an arm cut a cut or, right. or whatever. You know, it was a simple thing, but it was a uh, strange. Yeah. Yeah, so now that the soul, as you put it, has returned, um, if you bang your toe, it's like, ow, my toe. You, and you take, totally. You, you take care of it, right? Of course. And it hurts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it hurts you. It hurts Della, right? Of course. Okay. Of course. 
Yeah. Now, um, and being here, you know, they, you, you can be touched by by the beauty, by by the pain, by whatever arises in, in reality, which is beautiful. It's even more painful than before because it's just so direct. Mm. You know, the experience is so direct that it's overwhelming with in, intensity. Interesting. But that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Now, is it a multi-dimensional sort of thing where, you know, yeah, the pain, Della feels the pain, but there's also a dimension which is impersonal, beyond pain, uh, you know, and, and, and a large part of your awareness resides there, or is it really just not so complicated? It's just simple reality, experiencing what you're experiencing. I guess it depends. Uh, it varies. So I don't know, sometimes there's uh, more silence than experience and sometimes there's only the experience. It doesn't matter. You know, the point of view doesn't matter about what is happening in reality. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the reason I asked that question is some people say it's kind of like a spectrum where, you know, you your attention can move back and forth on the spectrum according to the need or the circumstances. And sometimes there might be a real sharp focus on some individual consideration, and sometimes it might be much more universal and transcendent and, you know, beyond the personal. And, and sometimes there's a sense of the integration of the whole spectrum in one, in one awareness. Um, people describe it differently, so I, I'm just curious what you had to say. Mm. I don't know. I, I think one thing is that I, I do not discriminate, discriminate a lot mm -hmm. on what is... Um, on how I would experience things is just so different from one moment to another and it's just very simple because it's just the way it is. There's no, uh, there's not a lot of uh, discrimination about that. Yeah, that's good. Probably sometimes my questions tend to overcomplicate the matter because, you know, someone like you is living in a very simple state of awareness and it is what it is and I'm more kind of intellectual and asking all these questions and probing different perspectives and all. <laughs> it, it probably probably seems like I'm making more of a fuss about it than, I, than needs to be made. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's really interesting. All people are, are experiencing different things and different perspectives and it's beautiful, really. Mm. Do you have a sense of um, continued progress or unfoldment, like a sense of adventure, like, ooh, this month it's this, and now it's this, and there's, there's some kind of exploration still taking place? I think the human experience is, is it's a never-ending story. It's beautiful. Uh, I think uh, uh, there's always opportunities to open uh, the heart even deeper mm -hmm. uh, through all what I go through. So for me, it's a never ending thing. There is something that is obvious that is oneness and, and consciousness. And there's, there's only that, but from an incarnation point of view, it's a never ending and beautiful uh, experience unfolding. Mm. Do you, by incarnation point of view, do you, do you mean like reincarnation? Like we might have multiple lives and keep on growing or you just mean as incarnate beings? Uh, well, I was talking about incarnate beings, but I, I, I don't know if there's other uh, incarnation. Mm -hmm. It it would make sense from the point of view of um, of time, but uh, I really don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, you write from well, I haven't read a lot of what you've written because most of it's in French. But you sent me some translations of little bits of it, and um, and you talk about being sort of guarded or protected and, and in this interview you've also mentioned that and um, so I'm just curious I mean you know a, a snail for instance has a shell and mm. it would die without the shell it needs the protection um, yeah. and so well, I guess we build up a kind of a shell around our hearts or around, around our person in a certain way uh, due to certain life experiences which we feel protects us from the world um, and, you know, like snails, do we need to have that protection um, or, uh, or, and does there need to be a certain development of inner strength before the, pr the pr protection can be dropped? And will the protection just drop off spontaneously once that inner strength has developed? Or, um, 
or is uh, are we putting the cart before the horse here and, and can we just somehow in some way voluntarily drop the protection and we'll be okay and the strength will rise to meet the challenges uh, well I guess there's there is one point well the protection can be just fine and most of human beings uh, have their protection and they even don't question it because it's just comfortable and that is the way they are uh, the thing is the the point for me is when the the protection are becoming uncomfortable and where we feel that there's a lack of oxygen because we're stuck in something so being str being strong or not it doesn't matter because if you're suffocating in the protection you will have the impulse to look at that mm. so uh, and i think we totally have the strength because we are life there's nothing separating us from life the, the, that is the protection that is uh, uh, protecting us from this evidence so i guess if there is this discomfort and, and this yearning for oxygen and for being and for simplicity i think that's the most beautiful gift to to see that the protection is not needed there's nothing to protect well, we are life, you know, but I mean, you use the word soul and, you know, some souls have been traumatized, have been abused, have been damaged by, you know, rather severe circumstances and, uh, and, there, and therefore they throw out protective mechanisms. So I'm wondering if there's, if, if those protective mechanisms are, are necessary for, for them and how do you best get them out of that? kind of shell bound existence uh, is it just by ripping off the shell or is there some way of in, of uh, inculcating or developing greater inner strength in which case the shell will become superfluous mm. well uh, i always ask you know what the people want mm. because I, I will never ever think of removing a shell if the intention is not there so so that's that's the basic thing if someone is asking well we can discuss together what's what's there and is there uh, still something to protect if so it's fine but can we open to the possibility that uh, maybe uh, this time of protection is over or not you know but it comes from the the inner impulse of each individual to to see if if the uh, if the shell is still important. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice gentle way of putting it. I mean, back in the 60s and 70s, there were these encounter groups that were popular and they were quite brutal in terms of ripping away people's protections and uh, could be quite damaging for people. Uh, but it sounds like uh, uh, that you're going about it, and I, you know, I didn't even think otherwise for a moment, but you're going about it in a very gentle, natural way, which wouldn't be traumatizing, which wouldn't traumatize people even further. No, that's really important for me to not to not to go through a limit that is obviously there. That is basic, basic. Uh, the opening of the heart for me is just associated to security and offering a loving environment to offer whatever's real for, for the person in front of me. That's the thing. Even even if we open totally to the fact that the protection is needed, sometimes it's just that that will make the person realize that it's not necessary anymore mm. because we totally honor what's there, you know, the reality of the moment. Yeah. I think it's a simple. Um, here's a question that came in um, from Dan in London. He asks, um, it sounds like Della had a journey from, quote, having a sense of personal self, unquote, to, quote, having no sense of a personal self, unquote to, quote, having a sense of personal self again. Can Della explain the difference between the sense of personal self from before and after the awakening? It sounds like the pre-awakening personal self was more influenced by conditioning from society, whereas the post-awakening personal self is more influenced by her eternal soul. That's a really good question, Dan. Thank you. Mm. Well, I think that's, uh, that's, that's right. I think the, the previous personal self was a, a condition uh, self it was uh, it was conditioned it was limited it was uh, uh, functioning uh, 
according to society and family and personal beliefs. So it was really a, a limited expression of, uh, of Della at the time. And it was fine because I was happy and it was a, a, a nice life. So there was nothing to say about that. But then uh, afterwards, you see, there's this, there's this free soul who's, who's here and uh, is just enjoying uh, moment by moment the reality of what is and unfolding this this joy of being here and being vulnerable and being touched by life. Mm. Yeah, Dan's question kind of reminded me of a nice metaphor, which is that the caterpillar has a personal self and the butterfly has a personal self, but in between, in the larva stage, it's all mush. You know, there's, <laughs> there, there's, there's, there's no sort of distinguishable entity in there. It's just mush. And then the, the imaginal cells kind of create the butterfly and we end up with a beautiful butterfly. So you, you kind of had to go through that metamorphosis stage, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> huh. that's, a, that's a very interesting. Um, I imagine that if you were to, um, don't, don't let me put words in your mouth, but if you were to describe, you know, your sense of self now and how it functions with your sense of self then and how it functioned um, that now there's a you know I'll, I'll let you carry on with this this what I'm about, what I'm saying here but there, there must be um, just a, a night and day difference in terms of spontaneity and freedom and um, and qualities like that yeah I think the first word that would come is spontaneity because uh, everything is fresh you know there's there's this there's this laugh inside to to, uh, to discover the moment as it is. There is something really free and, and laughing. And, uh, you know, there's a way of seeing life as everything is a, is a surprise and an invitation to open my heart more mm. uh, all the time. So there's not a lot of uh, thinking about evaluation and judgments and stuff like that it's just there are thoughts there there can be a lot of thoughts thoughts sometimes but it's it's just uh passing you know it's, i i don't i cannot adhere to those uh process of thinking most of the time it's just it's just funny you know to see all, all this uh all this popcorn uh, going on is just amazing, amazing to see how life is generous of experiences. So yes, it, it's quite different. Yeah. With regard to thoughts, would you say that um, your mind tends to be generally more quiet than it was before the shift? That, you know, there might be some extraneous popcorn, as you say, some flurry of mental activity, but, for, but is there much less inappropriate or extraneous or unnecessary mental noise going on yeah i would say it's quite it's really quiet a lot of silence it's yeah it's a, there's a lot of sil silence yes yeah but even you know when there's no attachment to what is going on it, it doesn't matter what's going on mm. you know it's a, i do not believe what's there even when i talk to you everything I say I you know I know that there's that's a story and and life is more simpler than that it's just the moment and then we play uh, at, at discovering what what is beautiful in, in that experiment we are doing yeah I, I said this the other week that but in a way there's a there's a handicap in doing interviews like this because we're talking about something that is kind of so simple and intimate and natural and but we can if we're going to actually have a conversation we have to use words and yeah and words are a far cry from the actual experiences you know like you if you and i were to sit here for an hour and talk about what a mango tastes like you know and and what its chemical mm -hmm. composition is and what it's you know biological or genetic you know background is and all that, we can go on and on but it, it would be nothing like actually eating one mm. <laughs> that's true <laughs> But, you know, it's the nature of the medium. We're, we're, we have to use words here. Of course. Yeah. And, you know, one of my motivations for doing these interviews is that, you know, by using words, it inspires people to go for the experience. And we get many, many reports of people who have 
had awakenings listening to interviews or, or going off and spending time with someone I've interviewed and, and undergoing some profound, beautiful shift of some sort. So that's, that's kind of what motivates this thing. Yeah, of course, it's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's important to have uh, to have some uh, some media to to help people going through this stuff. It's uh, it's an amazing journey. Yeah, yeah. Um, one one other thought about your, about thoughts that came to mind. <laughs> thought about thoughts is: uh, Do you find that your thought process is such that? Um, very kind of quiet, gentle impulses just arise from who knows where, and that you you find you can trust them to a great extent. They are probably 100% that they are just um, kind of a natural impulse of what's right in the moment, and perhaps creative ideas that come up. I think I'll do this, but they end up just having a kind of a rightness to them that um, you have come to rely on as being trustworthy? I think so. I think just listening uh, in silence of what arises is quite some wisdom there. There's quite some wisdom there. So yeah, I think to, I think it's good to, to put our attention on, on, on what's arising mm. before, you know, before all what, how we should think but just listening uh, from silence, I think there's a lot of wisdom there. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else would you like to tell us? I know you're probably not going to come up with a lot unless I ask you questions, um, but because uh, that's the way you operate. But um, is there are there some major things that you like to talk about with people that I haven't thought to ask you on any kind of question about? Well, I guess the main uh, the main message for me is that. Uh, there is uh, there is the awakening, which is um, for me is overrated in the sense that um, there's a lot that that ego puts on what is awakening mm. and uh, how it should be and the experiences and the freedom and everything. But reality coming back to reality it can be a step by step thing where we can just open our hearts to be touched by life and to uh, to meet the emotion that is there and to stop you know just uh, projecting uh, to others what we're what we're feeling and bringing this back inside and opening more and more and more and uh, for me it's the it's a beautiful lovely path to uh, take responsibility for the oneness we are because we, we play at being two all the time but the invitation and it is possible to bring oneness inside by taking responsibility of what we go through and what we live and questioning the beliefs that create separation and bringing love and light to to what's there it's 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 possible and it's a very gentle path to open ourselves to what's inside mm. really beautiful there's nothing to protect that it, we can totally embrace protection and realize that there's nothing to protect mm. so when you say bring oneness inside i think you what you mean by that is to experience oneness or live oneness, uh, right? Is that what yeah. You mean? yeah. Yeah. Become, you know, become this oneness inside right. that is already there because it's just that the attention plays at two, at being two all the time. Right, being fragmented. Yeah. And, and, and the invitation is really to, to take the chance to see, uh, is it really necessary to, to play duality? Yeah. Um, and the thing you said about the ego kind of projecting what awakening is supposed to be and all that, um, I think that's an important point too because, well, I don't know, I, I kind of see it both ways. On, on the one hand, a lot of times people dumb it down in, in the sense that they, 
they think, oh, it's just this. It's whatever you're experiencing, that's all it is. That's awakening. You're enlightened, you know. <laughs> and uh, and I don't know if they're necessarily actually really experiencing things as richly and deeply and clearly as as one might. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes people think, oh, it's this incredible thing. If, you know, if you were if you could see the world the way Ramana Maharshi saw it, you would just be like blown away, and, and you know you would be having, you'd be, you'd be seeing angels, and you'd be, you know, communing with devas, and and you'd be able to levitate, and all kinds of marvelous things, which probably are not going to ever happen to the vast majority of people. In which case, they're they're going to wait forever for this marvelous thing that they might actually be much more uh, in tune with right now than they realize. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's true that of course of course we can see that there's a a shift. You know, there's something that happened. Uh but at the same time it's what from my point of view it's or it happens spontaneously or it's a byproduct of surrendering to reality. Mm. It's but if we check all the time, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender and then we see have, is there a shift? No. Okay. So, so then it's not a total surrender to reality because it, it, there is um, a condition. Okay, I will surrender up to the moment where there's a shift. Mm -hmm. So that's that's ego again, but surrendering to reality and being touched and, and taking responsibility. That's 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 the way for for me. That's the way. And the shift is a byproduct. It's uh, something happening when when the rest has, has if there is no attachment anymore that is more important than reality yeah, and also if you're surrendering and surrendering and surrendering if you're kind of like beating yourself up with the the notion of surrendering all day long haven't you kind of spoiled the spontaneity and innocence of of living is surrender really something you have to do no of course not if you have to do something there's a problem because uh, the reality is full right now, but it's re it's important to see uh, the position you you are at the moment. Are you in refusal of reality or not? Because if you are in refusal, you feel duality all the time. Yeah. So it's interesting to look at. Huh. But the refusal is totally welcome. Also, if it's there, there's nothing to change really. But it depends on what you, what people want. Yeah. Well, what what do you mean by what they want? Well, if the yearning, not not what ego wants, but if the yearning is is to discover reality, even prior to the awakening shift, if there's something a yearning of discovering the true nature of life, this is going to be interesting to look at this position of refusal, because that's that's. That's the veil. We, we refuse what we want because what we are is already here. So th the only thing in the veil is the refusal of that because we say that's not enough. So that's uh -huh. ego, you know, that's ego in the way. And, and so that, I say ego, but it's a guardian that is playing with us to refuse the moment. So to keep in control and to keep uh, a safe area of knowing what is happening. And so it, it creates a net like a web like that. Uh, so we don't dive into the mystery of life. Mm. So, so it, it kind of sounds like you're saying that the more we assert control and try to maintain control and so on, um, the more we isolate ourselves and, and keep ourselves constrained and, and contained and, and and blocked from the you know the larger reality that that life as it is yes yes we play at that and we don't even realize that we play at being uh, constrained like that mm. so it's interesting to look at yeah I mean couldn't you almost say that that's the crux of it right there is um, you know by definition, awakening or enlightenment or whatever word we want to use it is a, a relinquishment of individual control and an individual um, constriction 
and a, re a relaxation into that which is, and, and a surrender into allowing, you know, nature itself to run the show rather than uh, than us meddling with it. Um, yeah. And, and so, in a way, um, individual effort is counterproductive. Um, it depends. If it's if it's uh, efforts coming from ego to get something else than what's already here. Uh, well, it has the uh, positive effect of uh, going towards exhaustion. Exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So, so that's if that's the path. That's the path. There's nothing to add to that. But if the impulse, the yearning, is to to feel a sense of truth and reality, well, then there's there are tools that are really helpful to see uh, the this game of duality. And, and protecting ourselves from our true being. Huh. It, it's really beautiful. It's interesting what you say about exhaustion, because there have been a number of cases of people I've spoken with, such as Adyashanti, for instance, who just really applied effort. I mean, you know, he was like busting a gut, trying to, you know, get enlightened. And, and finally, he just sort of gave up one day. And then he had this, this big uh, shift, this big awakening. Um, yeah. So, you know, in a in a paradoxical roundabout way, um, effort can be effective, but it's not the effort itself. It's it's the re the relinquishment of it ultimately that that does the trick. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, if the impulse is to work really really hard, that's the path. Yeah. It, because it's there. There's nothing to argue about having one path that is easier than another. It's just just look where you put your foot and that's the path mm -hmm. there there's no way you can mistake yourself uh, there's no way we're always on the right spot all the time yeah and it's worth mentioning that there are paths that are effortless from the outset that that don't involve you know hitting yourself over the head with a hammer because it feels so good when you stop but that uh <laughs> but that um you know, are effortless from the beginning and very effective. So, you know, if one, if one can find a path like that, all the better, perhaps. Of course, if it talks to the inner wisdom, that's that's great. Yeah. Mm. Um, let's see, a question came in here, and, and my editor friend hasn't sent it to me yet, but sometimes he doesn't get them. So let me just take a crack at it. This is from Zuzana, again in London. There's a lot going on in London today. Um, regarding your initial experience with hy hypnosis, did the hypnotist come across other clients who had similar reactions to his uh, or her sessions with you? Um, did he or she believe in alternative paradigms such as past life, afterlife, spirituality, transcendence, which would have influenced um, his or her way of working with you? Was he or she intentionally guiding you towards extraordinary expansion of consciousness or was it just a happy accident during a standard routine that wasn't spiritually inclined or, or you know, oriented? And if it was an unusual result for him or her, was he at all interested in exploring what happened to you and how he could use it in working with others from then on? Good question. I don't know. I haven't talked to him after that. Uh, so I know that he heard what happened to me because he was a, a friends of friends, mm -hmm. but uh, we didn't talk about it. And uh, I, I don't think that he was uh, on a spiritual path when we met. So. But that's all I know. I, that's all I know. I, I cannot say more about that. Yeah. It sounds like you were kind of primed. You know, you were just hot, yeah. hot to trot. You were ready to go. And <laughs> it could have, <laughs> could have been something else that might have triggered it for you, but it just happened to be this. Yeah, I think so. It, it feels like that. But, you know, you never know. Yeah. Um, okay. So... Let me uh, let, let me just ask you one more time: Is uh, is there anything else we haven't covered that you feel is important? I always, after I finish interviews, I always think to myself, "Oh, I should have asked that, and I wish I'd thought of that." So, is there anything I, uh, we're leaving out here that you 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 want to convey to people? I don't know. I think I think that everyone is perfect just the way they are right now, and it's just a beautiful gift to to offer ourselves to see the perfection we are already and to see the loving impulse in every action and every thought we have there is this loving impulse prior to to the experiment so i think it's just 
so nice to offer ourselves the possibility to see ourselves from a loving impulse. Yeah, that's nice. I remember reading some some line from a Zen teacher recently. He, he said to his students, you're all perfect just the way you are, and you could use improvement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's fun to realize it, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it kind of works that way, you know? I mean, everything's imperfect just as it is, and yet there, yeah. there's more to explore. Yeah. I think there's a natural yearning to to open to uh, to experience and experiment and and to uh, our true nature. I think everything is just here for that. The, the suffering that is uh, that is here. The, uh, the the everything in society. I think is is calling us to open to who we are, which is beautiful. Even if it's you can see that there's dark energies and stuff like that, which I I do not uh, see them like that. I see more like a, a, an awakening impulse of life to open to reality. Yeah. And if in the big picture, opening to reality is sort of the ultimate motivating force of the universe, then even the dark energies must some, in some way be in service to that. Yeah. That's, that's my feeling. I don't know if it's true, but that's my feeling. Yeah. Mine too. Um, you don't seem like the speculative type, but do you have any sort of um, feeling about where we're headed as a, as a society? I mean, any kind of new agey perspectives on you know how uh, whether kind of some kind of more enlightened age is 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 on the horizon, or don't you want to go there? I don't know. I think I think it would be fun that there was more more consciousness uh, arising. I think it would be really great. I think the invitation is here for that. Uh, where it's going, I have no idea. Yeah. I think everything's is fine, uh, but I have no idea where we're going. Yeah, but it's interesting to be part of it, isn't it? Yeah, it's really fun. I think we are in this very special. Uh, era here with uh, everything arising and happening and, and internet and ego just with giant structures and stuff it's really amazing to look at yeah that that kind of um, point is what leads me to believe that we are headed for big changes just because it seems to be somewhat unprecedented that we've had such a ex kind of a explosion of spiritual teachers and people having awakenings and and a, a technology to you know disseminate this information all over the world to millions of people um and there's never been quite that combination of factors before and mm. i i kind of feel like it can't help help but have an effect um you know it's, everything has an effect and 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 if there are and the changes that take place in individual consciousness do ripple up to the larger society. So it's it's kind of a, gives one hope, I think, for a better time coming, but also pretty major changes coming because there's so many things which won't fit in really well with with a more enlightened society by most people's definition. Yeah, I think I think it's it's so precious to have uh, like someone with you know. Uh, with the distance from ego that can be just transparent and authentic and and being free and spontaneous is just it's just so much fun to look at and i i think it's uh it's refreshing for everybody to have people around coming uh, with this new energy i think it's it's really precious uh to offer uh, authenticity to our society today yeah mm. I think it's what we really need in terms of, a, well, there was a song years ago, what the world needs lo now is love, sweet love, you know. <laughs> that, that's the only thing that there's just too little of. Uh, yeah, that's so true. You know, we're lacking a, of this joy of, of just being. And uh, I think we're invited to, why not, to play a little bit more of that. Yeah. Um, let me just... Uh, 
I was about to wrap it up, but another question just came in. So let me just see what this one says. It's again from Zella in London. Um, yeah, OK, this sounds like a good question. Um, regarding your transformation, it sounded from your conversation with Rick as, the, as though the process was sort of happening, unfolding and running its course within you, so to speak. A guidance that was later recognized as none, not, none other than you led you itself to greater freedom, authenticity, and recognition of reality as it is and its ultimate perfection. Do you think that had it not been for the initial wake-up call at the hypnotist, that it would not, that would have found another way of waking itself up? Can we force it, or are we ultimately at the mercy of a process that is beyond us? It will wake us up when it wakes us up, and not a second earlier, not a moment later. Is there really anything that we, it, can do before it decides it's time, before it is ready? Well, that's a really interesting question because um, from it depends on 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 what is uh, what is talking inside the, the inner wisdom. Because if uh, if the mind wants to be in control, if the ego wants to be in control, there is no way because it's it's the obstacle uh, of opening to our true nature. But inside, at the same time, there is this oneness. It is. Who we are. So if there's a yearning, uh, there's a calling, well, there's no way we can avoid doing the steps we do. That's, that's, it's, the, even if the mind will say, you know, there's nothing to do, it will do. It, mm -hmm. it will go towards the yearning, whatever strategies uh, you will find right, but it will happen. So it can be a guardian. Uh, of the mind saying there's nothing to do because saying there's nothing to do there's also uh, a refuge where there's not opening because there's nothing to do you know it's a safe place for the guardian to do there's nothing to do but at the same time if it comes from the heart and there there's humility of the heart that says there's nothing to do and there's nothing to add that's different yeah, I think you're making a very subtle and profound point, um, and um, it's one I've thought about a lot because there are a lot of people around saying there's nothing to do and nobody to do it, and it can lead to a sort of a mm, passivity or um, sort of defeatism or something, or like, oh, well, um, there's nothing to do, it's just going to happen if it happens, and, and uh, kind of a spiritual laziness in a way. Um, yeah. But there's a sort of a deeper, more profound sense in which there's nothing to do, which is very much associated, I think, with the word you've used a lot in this interview, surrender, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is a totally different matter than, than when that phrase is used superficially. Yeah, it comes from the heart, from a deeper place. There's, a, of course, there's nothing to do and there's everything to do, but there's for me, the most important thing is to take the risk to see what we're playing. Are we playing? Are we taking refuge in the ego's mind? Or are, are we really willing to open to taking the risk of surrendering? So it's really important for me to see. Yeah. Not, not even to do, because doing is already doing itself. It's, it's happening whatever we, we think, but are we uh, hiding from our true nature? Are we playing duality? Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. And um, the point you made about, um, you know, or in response to Zuna's, or whatever her name was, her question, uh, you know, is it just going to happen when it happens and without our having any say in the matter? Um, thought came to mind that, you know, a lot, and you said, well, if you have the impulse, if you have the inspiration, or if you have the motivation, you know, uh, but um, looking at it in a, in a larger sense, if, if again, uh, this sort of awakening or evolutionary development is built into the very purpose of the universe, then everything that happens to us can be seen as, uh, in, as being in service of that. And even, even the difficult stuff um, can be a kind of a goad or an incentive, uh, you know, moving us toward seeking uh, you know, release from it, seeking freedom. 
You know what I'm trying absolutely. to say? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we have so many opportunities. Of course, if, if our life is happy and we have joy, so there's no question about the meaning of life and, and what is true. But if if we have difficult stuff to go through, well, we have sometimes the question arising, well, who am I? And what is this for? And so from a psychologic point of view, we can have so many explanations, but for a more intimate point of view, that's the way, that's the way, you know, to come back home and to see uh, who am I? Yeah, I, I don't know if this story is, is, you know, just sort of metaphorical or, or actual, but there's some spiritual teachers who've said that, you know, the, the angels don't have very much incentive in heaven for spiritual enlightenment because they're so comfortable there. It's so nice, you know, and, <laughs> and, and uh, human life is much more conducive to it, you know, because it, it's not it's not just a, an easy ride like that. Absolutely. I think there's so many opportunities, like every day we have something that is refusing reality. So that's it. You know, that's it. That's that's the moment. Yeah. That's the moment. Nice. OK, well, I don't think there are any more questions that have come in. And uh, this has been a, a great conversation. Um, so I think we should wrap it up. Um, any final words before I do that? And they don't need to be final. <laughs> Hey, now, <laughs> doggy's excited about something. Um, they don't need to be final if, if we get going on something again, but if you have any little wrap-up words you'd like to speak. I think like everybody uh, can just trust their inner wisdom and they're just on the right path right away already in this moment. Nice. And since Luna just introduced herself, let me introduce Luna. Come here, Luna. <laughs> There we go. This is Luna. Wow, nice dog. Yeah, we adopted Hello. Her. We adopted her about a year ago. Oh. After driving hours and hours all around Iowa looking for the perfect dog. And we finally found her down to the shelter and somewhere down in Illinois. There we go. Beautiful. Yeah. Over over the years I've introduced various pets of ours on the show. <laughs> All right, so uh, so Della's website is DellaInvitation.com, and I'll be uh, linking to it from her page on BatGap.com. And um, you have a book in French, don't you? Yeah, I just uh, went uh, in libraries on February, on January, yeah. So is it on Amazon or anything like that? Yeah, Amazon. All right, so I'll link to it also on, Am on Amazon so people can get that. And um, they can go to your website, and there are parts of your website that are in French and some in English. And when you conduct retreats and stuff, do you do it uh, in French or English or both or what? Well, for now, we have we had French groups, but we're open to uh, English groups if, if there's a need for that. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sure there'll be interest, um, so you might need to set up both. And you, your English is probably as good as your French. I mean, you speak English perfectly well, so... <laughs> <laughs> It's, I feel it's not my mother tongue. Right. I suppose training as a doctor, you had to learn English or speak it well to, to go through medical school. Yeah, well, I, ha I worked in British Columbia and New Zealand, so I had to, right. I learned, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I learned to speak English. I had to. Good. Um, okay, so thank you, Della. And um, people can go to your website to find out more about you. You probably have some mailing list they can get on and so on. Um, of course. Yeah. So, uh, and thanks to those who've been listening or watching, let me just make a, a general wrap up point or two. Um, this, as I said in the beginning, is an ongoing series. And if you found this interesting, then go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu and you'll find um, hundreds of other interviews um, categorized in various ways. And um, if you'd like to be notified each time there's a new one, then there's a sign up form on the website for that. Um, there's also an audio podcast of this and a, a page that you'll see a link to where you can sign up uh, on Android devices or Apple devices and so on. And uh, the donate button, as I mentioned in the beginning, helps support the thing. Um, it's important uh, that it have that support because it's pretty much a full-time occupation for my wife and I. Um, and. Um, that's about it. So thanks for listening or watching, and we will see you next week. Um, that's it.
Thanks, Della. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Enjoyed it. <laughs>